We focused in many of our programs on some of the difficult days which may very well be ahead of us where those who, in the words of St. Paul the Apostle, will try to live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's not at all beyond the realm of possibility that those who try to adhere to the natural law, and especially those who try to practice the traditional faith, will face opposition. But juxtaposed with these difficult times, we have the words of St. Louis Grignon de Montfort, who wrote in True Devotion to Mary that Mary in the latter days, these days, will raise up saints who will eclipse most of the saints of antiquity to the same degree that the cedars of Lebanon exceed an ordinary shrub. I'm Julius Smetona. This is what Catholics believe. With me today to discuss devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary and especially her role in these days uh, are the Reverend Fathers William Jenkins and Clarence Kelly. Father Kelly is the Superior of the Society of St. Pius V from Oyster Bay Cove, New York. And Father Jenkins is uh, publisher and editor of the Roman Catholic and pastor of St. Teresa the Child Jesus Church in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, Father Jenkins, I understand that one of your parishioners uh, rather is having this program in memory of her deceased husband. Yes, that's right. Uh, one of our dear parishioners, John Neal, died a few years ago, and his wife, Mary, has uh, dedicated this program to him. Uh, in fact, she wrote me a letter and said this program is uh, made possible through a generous donation in memory of John Neal of Cleveland, Ohio. He's a member of St. Teresa of the Child Jesus Church in Parma. And uh, Mrs. O'Neill expresses the wish uh, that Almighty God, the Sacred Heart of Jesus, may increase our love and faith through this program. That's very beautiful. Uh, Reverend Fathers, I would answer the first question I'd, I'd like to pose is, uh, in fact, two questions. Uh, when things look very, very bleak, how in, will this happen, which St. Louis de Montfort says it will, where the Blessed Virgin Mary will raise up great saints? Uh, uh, and how would we, for instance, those of us who are living in these take, uh, times, take advantage of that? And I guess the more general question is, in gen is why has the Church always had recourse to, uh, to Mary? Why does she have such a special place in, in Catholic prayer and Catholic theology? Right. <clears throat> Perhaps a better way to say it, uh, Julius, would be that our Lord will raise up these saints through her intercession. But uh, with regard to the question of uh, bleak times and great things, uh, it is really true if you look at the history of the race, the history of God's dealing with man, that at those times, certain times anyway, when things seem to be really, really bad, that either certain things happened soon thereafter or certain great things were promised. For example, the fall of man. Uh, in the wake of the declaration of the consequences of the fall of man, God the Father promised to send a Savior. Uh, Good Friday, everything seemed lost. Easter Sunday followed shortly thereafter. So from the, God's point of view, it is a relatively easy thing to bring about great and wondrous things at the appointed time. It's just that he will do it through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary because uh, sin entered the world by one woman and life entered the world by another woman and this woman is the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Immaculate One, the Spotless One, the model, the ideal, the very flesh and blood from whom the Redeemer of the world uh, came to us. So it's, it's fitting and it's right that she should be the instrument in the hands of our Lord to bring about what ultimately will be the final blow to the devil, that Our Lady will use her to punish ultimately and finally the work of Satan as Satan used the first Eve to dethrone Adam. It is true that uh, in the world today, God has committed the care of the world's peace into the hands of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And those who want peace in the world must go to her, and they will find it in her hands. Uh, those who try to find peace through some political solution or some economic measures are not going to find it, except in the hands of Our Lady, because it is there that God has placed it. And he's done this uh, to exalt her. 
When a God placed his own infant son in the arms of the Blessed Mother, truly he placed the peace of the world in her hands physically. And so it remains today, and that should not uh, cause us to wonder. There are those who think that we exalt Mary too much when we ascribe this power to her. But uh, we cannot possibly ascribe too much good to her whom God has made his own mother, uh, even if we were to spend the rest of our lives extolling her and uh, honoring her, we could not possibly begin to pay her the honor comparable to what God himself has given her in making her the mother of his own son. Um, there are those who even go so far as to say that we as Catholics worship the Blessed Virgin Mary. We don't worship the Blessed Virgin Mary. It's possible that misguided Catholics at times, because of ignorance of the faith, have done so or approached that. Um, but the fact is, we merely recognize what God has done for her. And in honoring her, we honor what God and God's goodness has done for her and through her for all of us. People uh, very often are trying to come up with uh, natural solutions to crime, as you mentioned, to disorder in the world. Uh, they think that uh, we see now this tremendous drive for gun control, that somehow if you restrict possession of certain types of weapons, you will have peace, you will have order. Uh, they think if you pass a law, you will have fraud. But I think they miss a very central point, and these are problems of the human heart. And the human heart dictates much of this. How, and, and, and when we come to the question of the human heart, there's a question of Mary because she's the mediatrix of graces. Uh, how can, can people take advantage of this? How do they practice devotion to Mary? How do they take part of her, the privileges God has bestowed upon her? Well, the first way that they show honor to Mary is by imitating her virtue. You know, the maxim, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, is true. And uh, what we find in Mary, what we need today especially, is the exact opposite of what we found in Eve. That is why the fathers of the church refer to the Blessed Mother as the new Eve. That whereas Eve fell by uh, betraying God and disobeying him, Mary uh, repaired the damage done by Eve by her absolute submission to the will of God. And it is in this that we will find the solution to the world's problems. And it is only in this that we will find the solution to the world's problems. Because all of the problems in the world uh, stem from that rebellion against the divinely established order of things. Uh, if we, at least individually and personally, learn from Mary that willingness to accept God's will, uh, there will be a great deal of progress in the world towards that peace which the world cannot give, but only God can give, and he has chosen to give through Our Lady. By the way, for us now in the practical order, that is, for us who realize that the world has taken a turn for the worse, is, and it is in a very bad way, accepting God's will means bowing our heads and accepting with patience and perseverance the hardships of life and offering them to God in reparation for our sins and the sins of the world. Uh, Reverend Fathers, there's this idea that comes about in uh, the works of St. Louis de Montfort and in generally in Catholic thought, this so-called age of Mary. Uh, are we in the proximity of the age of Mary, especially as uh, we, we saw three or four tremendous uh, apparitions at Lourdes, at Fatima, at La Salette, uh, and, and such, and uh, are these indications that we are in the age of Mary? And at the same time, paradoxically, if this is the age of Mary, how can things be so bad? Well, actually, the great uh, manifestations uh, of God through the Blessed Virgin Mary began in 1830, and there was a whole sequence of marvelous and spectacular apparitions of Our Lady lasting up until the year 1917. And in the course of those apparitions, she came to earth as a kind of prophet. She came as an ambassador representative of her, of her divine son with a message to mankind. And the message to mankind was that mankind was offending him and uh, that she could no longer hold back the wrath of her divine son. But in the midst of all of that, of course, there is this element of hope 
And the element of hope is that she, through her motherly intercession, will win from the Sacred Heart of Jesus all of the graces necessary uh, for mankind. You know, when our Lord appeared to St. Margaret uh, Mary, he told her, he said, my heart is so replete with love for men that I can no longer restrain myself. In other words, our Lord is looking to pour out his great mercy upon mankind, but he is in a certain sense restricted by his own justice. I mean, there does come a point in time when God has to stop and say that these people have to be punished. So we might look upon the Blessed Virgin Mary as a kind of means devised by God from all eternity to set aside e to an even greater degree his own justice. So in other words, if, if, if the Blessed Virgin Mary goes to her divine son and she pleads with him on behalf of mankind, it is impossible for him to refuse that request, nor does he want to refuse that request any more than he wanted to refuse the request uh, at Cana, where she said they have no wine, and as a result of that, our Lord performed his first public miracle. The age of Mary, however, which I personally believe is part and parcel with this great and wondrous series of apparitions, which was uh, topped off by the miracle of the sun at Fatima, I believe that it is, that is, in a certain sense, maybe part one of the age of Mary, and the second part of the age of Mary will be the great revival in the church. We stand, I personally believe, on the brink of a great revival in the Catholic Church. When everything seems lost, when it seems like three o'clock on Good Friday, with no hope, then our Lord will do his great and wondrous things. And these are some of the things referred to by St. Louis de Montfort. St. Louis de Montfort foretold that there will be a time when great saints again would walk this earth. And he called it the latter times. And uh, this would be the age of Mary. And these saints uh, would be raised up through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And they will fight. He says that they will fight with both hands. Uh, they will pray and uh, they will contend against the forces of evil. They will have a crucifix in one hand and a rosary in the other hand. And I think that personally, that we are not far from that age which will nullify the terrible disaster that occurred as a result of the Second Vatican Council. It will be through the mercy of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, but poured out to us through the motherly intercession of Our Lady. You're watching with Cast 3. Father so, Julius, there is no personage in the history of salvation who stands so much against the spirit of this modern age as the Blessed Virgin Mary. When you look at her virtues, you see how she is a reproach to the world as it is today. Her humility stands as a reproach to the pride and the brashness of the world, especially when it comes to uh, the, the feminine or the female sex. Uh, how she um, pleased God so completely by her fidelity to the divine calling to her to be the mother of God and to be totally at his service. Um, the idea of, of service is even twisted today to mean uh, that I'm in charge here, okay, and I have prominence and I have a position and I have a title and so on and so forth. And I want to be a priest. And I want to be a priest, <laughs> yeah, or whatever, or a bishop. you know. Uh, but that wasn't Mary's way at all, and it wasn't God's way with her uh, to, to, to make her that uh, a world leader or a, a leader in her community, as Paul VI said in, in his uh, document on the Blessed Mother, Mariales Cultus, which was an insult to her. Um, her, uh, her perseverance, her patience, uh, her silence itself is like a reproach to the age. Uh, which is so brash and so loud and so bawdy. Her, her uh, virginity and purity, every, every aspect of her character is like a reproach to the world as it is today. And so um, if there are those in the world who will go to her and will not be too proud, because this is what keeps even, even Catholics often from devotion to Our Lady, a pride in them, uh, a resistance to the idea that uh, emulating her humility will give them the power um, 
to uh, uh, to change the the course of things in the world today. There, there there are people who enter political movements. There are people who enter educational movements who say, well, you know, all of this this prayer and and, and so on. That's good for for weak souls. But I'm strong and I can get in here and mix it up with the enemy and I'll make a dent, and so on. That's that's not true. Uh, there's only one power on earth that can affect what is happening in the world today for the better, and that is the power that comes from heaven. And the only way to implement that power is the way that our Blessed Mother did, by her humility and her acceptance, by her faith, by her purity. Without these, a person cannot help the world. There are, let me, I'm sorry, I'm going, going on here, but I, I'm aware of political and educational organizations today in this country that recognize there's a serious problem with the social, socialize, socialization of this country and the moral perversion of this country. And they claim that they are out to, to resist these things, and yet these organizations themselves are staffed by people who have their divorces, who have their birth control, who don't pray, uh, refuse to pray the rosary in many cases. Why? Because they're so busy fighting the battle and winning it themselves, they think. These are part of the problem, and they are drawing down God's punishment upon, upon all of us. The only solution is to study our Blessed Mother and her love for God's will and for God's Son, and to emulate that. And the more we, we accept that fact, the closer we will be to the glory of the age of Mary. I had a question yeah. for you, Father Kelly. If I'm yeah, I just wanted to say that there are people who watch the program. For example, we know there are a goodly number of non-Catholic people who watch the program who may be wondering about this and wonder, well, why, why the big emphasis on Mary? Why state it as though it were a necessary thing and so forth and so on? And I think it involves understanding to some degree uh, the will of God and the mind of God, because as Father Jenkins said, Our Lady stands out in absolute and perfect contrast to the spirit of the modern world. But you know whose spirit she also stands in contrast to? The spirit of Lucifer. So you have to understand that. You have to go back to the very beginning. In the first moment of his existence, all God requested of him was the performance of one single meritorious deed. When God created the angels, he created the angels in sanctifying grace, he created them happy, and he was on the verge of bestowing upon them the beatific vision. And the only task they had to do, the one single thing they had to do to win uh, be it the beatific vision, beatific love, and beatific joy for all eternity was to perform one single uh, meritorious deed. All they had to do was to recognize you know, a minute ago I didn't exist, now I exist. Everything I have has come from God. The, the, the spirit that they should have had was to fall down before God in gratitude for creating them and for bestowing upon them these wonderful things. But Lucifer, followed by one-third of the angels, said, I will not serve. I will not do it. I will ascend above the heavens and I will be like the Most High God. And when you see what Lucifer did, and then he took his rebellion to the earth, and he led Eve into sin, and Eve led Adam into sin. And now we have the Immaculate Virgin Mother of God. She, the privilege that was bestowed upon her, was immeasurably superior to the privilege that God bestowed upon any other creature, any other human being. I make that distinction because the sacred humanity of Christ is the most exalted uh, of all creatures uh, created things but God bestowed upon the Blessed Virgin Mary the singular privilege of becoming the mother of the Son of God the mother of God and she was just overwhelmed with sublime humility and submission in her words in her deeds in her actions in her life she stands in perfect contrast to the devil the devil was I will exalt myself the Blessed Virgin Mary, my soul magnifies the Lord. The devil, my spirit exalts in me. Our Lady, my spirit exalts in God, my Savior. She recognized that God had done mighty things to her, but she turned it all back to God in this wondrous, humble, loving submission to the Creator. So as Father Jenkins said, if we are looking for a human being, a human being 
that perfectly and wondrously embodies all of the qualities of our Lord Jesus Christ it is found in the Blessed Virgin Mary. If you want to know what to do, if you want to know how to behave, if you want to know what humility is in a practical order, then look at the Blessed Virgin Mary. It is no wonder, uh, as it is said in sacred scripture, that he, the Son of God, the incarnate Word of God, will use his mother to deliver the final blow to Satan at the end of the world. And Satan now lies in wait for her heel, and as St. Louis de Montfort says, he trembles, the devil trembles at the sound of her holy name. There's, uh, there have been many people, Father Kelly and Father Jenkins, as you're sure aware, who've, uh, who've had difficulties in their lives and are trying to practice the faith and hold on and sometimes ask, what can I do? Well, certainly one of the things which I, I would imagine they certainly could do is practice this devotion of the Virgin Mary. But you mentioned an interesting point that some people consider themselves, you know, too strong to stoop to something like this. I'll never forget what one of our guests, Joe Scheidler, the champion of the unborn said, who was in the midst of a, of a very serious criminal charge that was uh, levied upon him in a, in a very unfair way in Florida because he tried to defend the rights of the unborn and he was facing, if it was going to go through, a very lengthy prison prison uh, sentence and financial and personal ruin and he literally as he mentioned said mother help me you know completely broke down very humbly and uh, he said when the plane landed and uh, the planes were all he was on this plane going to this uh, pre-trial hearing all the charges were dropped mm -hmm. okay. which is uh, and he attributed it to our lady absolutely he said if he ever had a, doubts a, he never had the big for that powerful man physically mm -hmm. and he was not too proud to invoke the help of our Blessed Mother. Uh, and uh, I think it's an excellent example and if, if more of our you know, good leaders for the right would turn to Our Lady in, in that humility, I, I know they'd be much more effective. You know, people sometimes uh, think that the honor paid to Our Lady somehow detracts from the honor paid to Our Lord, but we have to understand that, uh, that the privileges that God bestowed upon Mary were for the sake of Jesus. They weren't for her own sake that uh, God preserved Mary free from original sin and uh, had her immaculate conception take place for Jesus' sake because God the Father loved God the Son so dearly that he prepared a worthy tabernacle for Jesus on earth. I can praise you, Julius. And on occasion, I have. <laughs> Don't do it. Not and, too often. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's right. funny. You'll have a Protestant minister who will praise another Protestant minister, right. and, and might and even and ask them to pray for him. And ask him to pray for him. Right. And the one Protestant minister might even say, "Of course, you know, we thank God for the gifts that He's given you, uh, brother uh, Paul, or, or whatever, you know." But when it comes to our Blessed Mother, they they won't follow that same thought. Uh, they they think turning to her example and then praising what God has done for her is somehow diverting attention from God to her. And uh, there's a double standard there, and I can't help but think that the lack of logic is due to a certain prejudice against, prejudice against her. We have to understand that all of the, the greatness of Mary, the exceptional, extraordinary, and unique greatness of Mary, is the work of God accomplished for the sake of his love for his son, and that acknowledging the uniqueness of Mary and her extraordinary greatness as the work of God for the sake of Jesus. That in no way detracts from God's glory. And also, it has to be pointed out that Christ is not known today. There are a lot of people who have his name on their lips, but they don't know him. They don't know what he wants from them. Uh, they, they take the Bible up and read the Bible and interpret it according to their own lights and think that that's the way they will arrive at the truth. And many of those people I know are of goodwill and want to find the truth and want to find the true Christ. But they have to remember, they have to accept him on his terms. And as he rejected the people of his day because they would not accept the Holy Eucharist, so he will not accept people who do not accept his love for his own blessed mother. So St. Louis de Montfort says that the reason that Jesus is not known in the world is because Mary is not known. And when she is known, when the mother is known, when the mother is loved, then Jesus will be known and loved and exalted throughout the earth. You know, that's, that's very profound. And uh, of course, we would expect to hear that from St. Louis Grignon de Montfort. But it, it actually expresses in a much better way the point that 
in acknowledging the great privileges bestowed upon Our Lady, we're acknowledging the greatness of Christ, because those privileges were granted for Jesus' sake. So when people detract from an honor to Mary and try to somehow uh, cover up or diminish the privileges given to her, they're actually detracting from the greatness of the person of Christ who was the motive for those privileges. And uh, that is why we as Catholic priests have to try to impress upon people the need to turn to the Blessed Virgin Mary in this time. Uh, it is only when people turn to Our Lady and realize who she was that they will understand who Jesus, is, Jesus was and we'll start making progress in uh, returning the world to God. And so we say to the people the words that our Lord said on Calvary's cross, Behold thy mother, she is thy mother, and she will come to your aid. One last question. We have very little time left. Perhaps you could leave us with this thought. The church holds that one of the signs of predestination to heaven is devotion to the mother of God. It is true, and it is what the fathers of the church taught and what has been held down through the ages. And it's, again, it's what Father said. It's only logical. If devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary were to lead us away from Christ, we would condemn it as bad and wicked. But far from that being the case, as St. Louis de Montfort, it is the surest and most certain path to finding Christ. Find her, and you found him. You've been watching what Catholics believe.